Father is rich in treasures untold, walls of solid jasper and street of purest gold, mansions by the millions with pearly white gates, and I know me but the face of Jesus is what I long to see come on in welcome home child I know my Lord will say and I know I'll lay hold on it all someday We'll go down by the river, contented and free. And I'll say, thank you, Jesus, for saving a wretch like me. Mom and Dad will come to see me up there in my new home. On the hillsides of glory, living near my Father's throne. Treasures by the millions, He has promised me. But the face of Jesus is what I long to see. Come on in, welcome home, child, I know my Lord will say, and I know I'll lay hold on it all someday. Sometimes, like a message like tonight, that what I'm about to do is different than what I just got through listening to. And uh, that makes me feel a bit iffy, if you know what I mean. Uh, but uh, I guess it's pride that makes me feel the need to warn people before I preach. Uh, that'd be a part of it. But also, too, uh, it has to do with stealing someone's thunder. You know, somebody may walk out here and say, you know, I, I, that's a little different kind of a message. I, I don't want them to think it's because of their great observation. Amen. I was aware of that when I was praying, when I was preparing. Preparing, and then when I was preaching it. Uh, but I want to preach tonight on the subject of the faith of our fathers. The faith of our fathers, and I want to show you some highlights of faith during the church age. And so this is a message that's going to generalize our heritage and our history as saints of the church age. And we're going to consider periods of this age that we live in in regards to making a parallel with the history of the nation of Israel, at least where it matches. And uh, I'll be able to show you sometimes an illustration in the the Bible about what we're talking about that happened in church history and uh, show you the track that God led his people through uh, in the Bible and, and, and then explain how it happened in history. Now that's a different message. I realize that especially given that the nation of Israel is in no form or fashion to be confused with the body of Christ which is the church and of course Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the king of the Jews. Uh, he is the head of the body. He's the savior of the body. Uh, that's two different groups. Uh, this New Testament church that we're a part of, the makeup of it, uh, is neither Jew nor Gentile. Uh, we once were Gentiles, but now we're simply children of God through faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, right now Israel as a nation are partially blinded. Uh, there are a remnant of Jews that have been saved. And of course in the future there's going to be a remnant later on after the church is gone uh, that will uh, turn to the Lord in repentance and godly sorrow as Christ will reveal Himself 
himself much in the same way that Joseph reveals himself uh, to his brothers during that seven year famine. Uh, but the point is God's not through with Israel as a nation. And anyone that tells you that he is, according to Romans chapter 11, they're ignorant and uh, they're in their own uh, vain conceits. Uh, but in between what is the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and the rapture, uh, which biblically speaking is the calling up of the saints, both the dead in Christ and, and those which are alive when the Lord comes. It's going to be the first time when all the church comes together. We're going to meet the Lord in the air there. That's going to mark the end of this age. So in between Pentecost and the rapture, that's the church age. And uh, it began as a mystery. And it's a mystery in its makeup. And when it ends, Paul says, by the Spirit of God, Behold, I show you a mystery. And he goes on to declare unto us our glorification and the rapture unto the Lord, some beating the grave and some beating death itself, but all of us have victory uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's the church. That's not Israel. Israel's a physical seed of people that are covenanted to God uh, through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and later on David. They have a physical piece of property that is promised to them by the Lord. Uh, there's an earthly kingdom connected to them as a nation. That earthly kingdom is going to be exalted above all the nations of the world. And uh, you can say, well, Brother Gilbert, I don't believe that uh, Christ is going to sit on a throne, an earthly throne, and be a king over all the nations. But the uh, prophet Zechariah would differ with you. Matter of fact, the prophet by the Holy Spirit, the prophet Zechariah would differ with you. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, he said, the dead of the Lord cometh, where he, the Lord, is going to gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And it says, His feet shall stand on that day in the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, north and south. And he goes on to say these words in Zechariah 14, 9. It says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and His name one. Now I say all that to just simply say that there's a difference uh, between the nation of Israel and the New Testament church. Yet there are things that befell God's people in that Old Testament era there that we can look at and we can see they have that much in common with God's people in this New Testament era. So where do we begin tonight as we think about this message uh, speaking about an age, the church age, where there's a spiritual seed that is born unto God and makes up a heavenly people. Well, we'll start at the beginning. Here in John chapter 1 verse 10, it says of Jesus, He was in the world. The world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's pray. Lord, I simply ask for utterance tonight that you'll help me to convey this message. By a bit of an odd message, Lord. I, I know, but I pray, God, it'll go forth. And, uh, Lord, it'll give wisdom and instruction, Lord, give encouragement about what our role is, what spirit we're of, what a privilege it is to be a part of this spiritual body known as the church of which Christ is the head. Lord, I pray that you'll just bless your word tonight as it goes out. Give us understanding of the message and help us to make application. Lord, I guess the greatest thing we could ask for uh, in regards to pleasing you is that you would increase our faith. That is what pleases you. And as one of your choice servants said that if we're to please you, we are to attempt great things for you and expect great things from you. And so, Lord God, I pray you'll increase our faith. Lord, knowing that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, I simply ask tonight that you'll help me to preach the Word of God and to do so in a way, Lord God, that it'll stir the hearts of these hearers. Thankful for every man, woman, boy, and girl that has come out. Lord, we pray that you'll participate in the meeting, bear witness to the truth, speak to every heart right where we're at, show us what we need. And God, if there's someone here that's unsaved, we pray for their soul tonight. Ask you to bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ before it's too late. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There in those two verses, verse 12 and verse 13, we've, we really got it all summed up for us there, how it began in our relationship with the Lord, and then how it's going to finish. Uh, he speaks of our being born of God's power. 
Why? Because we received Christ. We received Him. And then how based upon that, we've been given power to become the sons of God. Now when he talks about becoming the sons of God in that reference, uh, that's a reference to the future manifestation of the sons of God, which is going to manifest and reveal the glory of God among us as we come back at the second advent. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And listen, every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. The moment we received Him, the Bible says to us that we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 says that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and whom also after that ye believed he says ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise and he goes on to define that Holy Spirit of promise as the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory now what is Paul saying there he's saying this that the moment you trusted Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul he did more than just save your soul what he did was he sealed your soul and spirit by His Spirit until that time when your body is going to be completely redeemed at His coming. And beloved, that's what it's referring to when it says in John 1.12, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. You see, now we are the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be, but one day we know this. He's coming. And when He comes, that Spirit that He put down inside of each one of us that changed us on the inside, it's going to change us completely and His glory is going to be manifested by our very appearance. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. I became a member of the body of Christ the moment that I trusted Christ according to the Bible. That's when I became a member of the church. The moment I believed I trusted Christ I was a part of His church a part of His body. Right then and there I was sealed by His Spirit. Right then and there I was quickened by His Spirit. Right then and there I was born of His Spirit. And one day when Christ comes, amen, thank God that same Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. Amen. That same Spirit that abode in the Apostle Paul and the beloved disciple John and every New Testament saint that's ever lived that same Spirit's going to quicken my mortal body and going to carry me up and out of here as the Spirit has called out the bride and assembled the bride through the gospel He is going to deliver the bride to Christ Himself and He the Holy Spirit He's been working at this He's been leading towards this ever since He first came down to the believers of Jesus Christ at the moment He came down the other comforter Christ told us about. At that moment, there was now a spiritual body of which we could all be saved and be a part of. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 1 tonight. As I begin to highlight for you certain historical moments, that occurred in the history of the New Testament church. And as I said, we're going to illustrate these moments by his, Israel's historical periods as they're recorded for us in the Old Testament record. Now, it's a little strange. Uh, the Holy Spirit's already highlighted the church for us in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 with seven churches there that Christ addresses in, in Revelation 2 and 3, the uh, seven churches of Asia Minor. And uh, yet, this is a different kind of a thing I'm talking about tonight uh, rather than just dealing with the periods of history, we're highlighting faith, if you will. Highlighting
spreading faith during the church age, and it will not come close to constituting a church age hall of faith. No one message could do that. But as I said, it'll sort of generalize. It'll generalize those who live during those times and follow the Lord by faith uh, to right down to where we're at right now. And where we're at right now is we're at the tail end of 2014. And we're about to go into 2015, believe it or not. <laughs> I mean, it's right on us there. And uh, where we're at today, hopefully we can look at each one of these periods that are highlighted for us by the faith of these saints that lived during these times. And we can take something from what they did in their example and we can apply it to our lives right here and right now because we certainly need it. Now, first of all, concerning the faith of our fathers, I want to consider with you the faith of the early saints there in the church. The early saints. We know the first period following the completion of the New Testament canon, which was the book of Revelation, which was written as late as 96 A.D. The apostles are off the scene. John's the last one standing. He eventually uh, passes away. And you're going there into a period of great persecution under pagan Rome. Uh, but it was also at the same time a period of great growth. Now the persecution in many instances cost those early believers their lives. So the question is how did the church grow? How did the church grow during this time uh, when so many were being uh, crucified and burnt and imprisoned and banished and starved? Uh, how is it so many of them uh, that began to grow and multiply? How did the church grow? Well, that's why I've had you turn to Exodus chapter 1, uh, where this uh, church history fact is illustrated for us in the Old Testament record. It says in Exodus chapter 1, look at verse 12, it says, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Now historically this happened to Israel because there was a new king there in Egypt that didn't know Joseph. And he was insecure about the people of Israel. And insecure and afraid of them, he began to turn the heat up on them. No matter what he'd done though, they continued to grow and multiply, it says. Notice right above this, verse 7. Verse 7 it says, And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now again, I'm not mistaken here tonight. I know I'm reading Israel's history. But this is something we have in common. This, our history as the church has this in common with Israel's history. The more the church was afflicted at the beginning, the more she grew, the more she multiplied. Throughout the book of Acts, we watched the, the revelation and the understanding of the gospel and what God was doing. We see that begin to develop and take root in the hearts of the believers as you get right up to the conversion of the apostle Paul there in Acts chapter 9. And by Acts chapter 11, through persecution, believers are scattered throughout all the way up to Syria to a place called Antioch. And the Bible tells us there in Acts chapter 11 verse 26 it says quote they were first called Christians in Antioch. Alright so that's where uh, those of us that call ourselves Christians we drive a stake down right there as far as a major happening in church history. Where were they first called Christians? It was in Antioch. And even before the completion of the New Testament canon there in Acts chapter 8, chapter 9 and 3 chapter 11, we know there is great persecution. The book of Romans would tell us about this. Here's what it says, Romans 8, 35. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Listen, as it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. What a heritage. Amen. What a history. What a privilege it is to belong to this group called the New Testament Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the faith of our fathers. Brethren, that includes the church at its earliest stages, suffering yet faithful, being killed, even slaughtered, the Bible says, but yet believing God's word holding to God's unchanging hand, going out and preaching the gospel, confessing His promises. That enabled them to see beyond this life, not to count their life dear unto themselves, but to see beyond this life and embrace the promises with Christ. And by their faithfulness and remaining true to faith itself, that gospel took hold. People heard 
people believed. People got saved. And the church multiplied and grew. How did the church grow during such a period of intense persecution? I'll tell you how. It's called the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People preached the gospel. People heard it. They believed it. And they got saved. And the gospel got going in places where believers went. And they preached and they witnessed there. And people got saved. And then they moved away for different reasons. And the gospel went where they went. And people got saved. Amen. Now, the gospel kept going. The vehicle to whom it was entrusted was the church. Those early saints there who esteemed the gospel above their own lives. Folks, that's history right there. That's your history. That's my history. That's the spirit we're of right there. That's the body we all belong to. Now listen, having an understanding of church history gives us insight to where we're at and whether or not uh, we're on track or not. If you don't understand church history, you don't have any point of reference. You don't know how we got here. You don't know where we were when we started, what our purpose was, and where we're going. Amen. Now, now you've got to have some idea of church history there to determine if there's been any progress or not. But uh, certainly, amen, as the church got started, uh, the gospel went out and people heard it. They went, the gospel went where the people went. And the people preached wherever they went. People heard and people were saved. I've looked at different church histories. There's some, of course, obviously, that I value more than others. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of church histories that are just a downright joke. Uh, some church histories are anti-church history. Uh, they report the oppositions against the church as church history. And, and, and it's really, a lot of things are just hilarious. It'll say things like, uh, how the gospel ever got to this region, we're not aware. You know, How it was that Christianity began to spread over here in this country, we don't know. It's not hard. Yeah. Somebody who was saved <laughs> went there. <laughs> you understand? They preached to those people. Amen. Those people heard. Amen. Those people believed. Amen. They were saved. And that's how Christianity got there. <laughs> you understand? There was no mystical floating around of this gospel. The gospel's been entrusted to us. Amen. And it goes where we go. Amen. And we preach it wherever we go. Amen. And people hear it. And people get saved. Amen. And the Lord is glorified. Now Rome at that time is the center of the world. Amen. It had a long reach there. And already following the death of the Apostle John, Christians are being overwhelmed by persecution and martyrdom. But understand, remember that in Rome, it is, its main objective is to make the world Rome. And their idea is to bring peace, Pax Romana, Roman peace, and to control its subjects under the government of Rome. They want unity. They want peace. They're very tolerant of every religion under the sun. Rome was a, was a government of many gods. As a matter of fact, the emperors themselves taught the people that they were gods. They worshipped gods. And, and if they went in and they conquered a culture or a province, those people were allowed to continue to worship their gods that they had according to their province they were in. So what was the problem with Christians? Why Christians of all these other religions and all these other gods that are being worshipped, why is it that those that follow Jesus Christ were tortured and killed? And the reason is because they believed in one God. Amen. And they were intolerant to the thought of many gods. Amen. They believed this, folks, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that if you didn't believe in Him, you died in your sins and you went to hell. Amen. Now, they, because of that, were considered divisive, and they were considered hateful. They were accused of hatred. That was a legal charge made against them. Hatred of the human race. Because they preached against sin. They preached against gods and false idols. And they preached that if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. And people accused them of hating other people. And being divisive in their speech. Folks, listen, you need to know something about history. Because we're right on the precipice of that very thing kicking off even in America. That same spirit is growing right now. Uh, I mean, I, I'm against bullying. I'm against it. I, mean, I was bullied when I was a kid. But a lot of this stuff they're trying to push on people about bullying. And then they're coming in with a hate speech and everything else. All that is is to try to silence and intimidate Christians. And, and a lot of the things that we would have to say against false religion and immorality. 
They'd call that hate speech. And if you're street preaching, in some instances, they'd call that bullying. Matter of fact, they already have in some areas of this country. Now, this offense Rome became intolerant of, and it led to the execution of Christians. That is our history. This is why they got in trouble. It wasn't because they were religious. It wasn't because they were Christians and loved with Jesus Christ. It was because they were considered hateful and divisive. Odio de genera humanas, whatever it was. Hatred of the human race. That was the charge. The legal charge against Christians there. And these Christians, they went down by the multitudes. And according to all accounts, they went down swinging and they went down singing. <laughs> they counted it an honor and a privilege to die for the Lord Jesus Christ and to suffer for His name's sake. I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And there in Antioch, as I was speaking of, according to early historical accounts, Roman soldiers, they were baffled as to why they weren't having any more impact against Christians and the spread of the gospel in that area. And one man reported that it was due to the influence and the courage of one preacher there in Antioch. And his name was Romanus. And uh, they would capture Romanus, according to early history. They would capture Romanus. And he was of a noble background. So they tried to encourage him and educate him uh, about what they were doing and what they wanted him to say and how they wanted him to be tolerant of all the other gods. And he, he would preach that they were guilty of blasphemy and idolatry and that they needed to be born again, that there was one God and His Son was Jesus Christ. And, and he said, hey, any of the children in this area would tell you the same. And they grabbed a child at his challenge. And they took him before Romanus as they trussed him up and they had whipped him and lanced his side uh, with knives uh, there where he bled. They, they asked the child whether he believed in many gods or just one God. And the child said, we children believe there is one God and his son is Jesus Christ. And said that we cannot believe in this many gods that people talk about. And they, they accused Romanus of teaching this child. Well, Romanus had been an influence. He'd been a testimony in this village, obviously. But he hadn't personally taught this child. They took him up on the challenge and they had egg on their face, so to speak. And they got mad at Romanus. But to punish Romanus, they began to beat the child. And say, you brought this on him. You caused this. And they ran and they got the child's mother. And when she came up, the crowd was gathered around. They took the child by the head of the hair and they pulled its hair. They pulled the child's hair off of his head. His mother said, suffer my son. God will crown thy bloody scalp with a crown of glory. <laughs> I mean, just Christians of another breed, a different kind of an iron. Listen, that's our history. Where situations were created publicly to intimidate Christians and back them away from being a public influence of the gospel, and it backfired because those folks had courage and they had faith. And they believed that when this life was over, there was glory waiting on them at the other side. Amen. Now listen, this brings us to the dark ages. The faith of our fathers during some faithless times. That's why I had you turn to 1 Kings 19. Here's a passage about some dark times. And this is Elijah. He's discouraged. And in verse 14, you'll see, he says, He said, I am very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword and I even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away now the Lord says down there in verse 18 look what he says yet I have left me 7,000 in, in Israel all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which hath not kissed him now, there were those that were worshiping Baal, obviously, and there were false prophets and false priests, and Ahab was king during this time, and Jezebel is the wicked queen. And it is a time of great darkness, and the people are being led astray by the multitudes. Elijah had withstood the darkness of his time, and now he's worn out. And he thinks he's alone, and he's ready to throw in the towel, and the Lord tells him, look, there's 7,000 during these dark times that still have not bowed the knee to Baal. They're still true to, to the, the Lord God Jehovah. Now, uh, there's a period in church history that's like this period right here. It's known as Satan's Millennial. 
It's also called the Dark Ages. And it's the darkest period of history following the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baalism under the guise of Christianity. Amen, That's what's going on. Amen. In the form of a state church Amen. reigned and spanned the continents using religion to control and oppress people. Amen. In the third century as people are just like water, they're only going to watch children being fed to beasts and women being tortured for so long. And a growing public sentiment against the persecution of Christians began to grow and as that began to take place you had political moves being made and there came along a man named Constantine that united both the eastern and western empires realizing that the only way to hold everything together was to recognize Christianity as the official state religion of Rome. I mean, I mean just looking at it from afar you think hey we won. I mean for three centuries they've been persecuting them and now all of a sudden they're saying, let's recognize it as our official religion, our official state church. And so they, they do this, they make the move there, they grant Christians special rights and privileges, and those Christians move from underground catacombs to uh, uh, these cathedrals. And they begin to have political advantage in the world. And when this happened, floods of unsaved men begin to come in and say they were Christians when they were nothing of the kind for political advantage and they brought all their pagan practices in time with them and all sorts of paganism came into the state recognized church there and uh, there was a head to the state church a man who was over the state church and all the uh, the emperors there became cardinals. Amen. It just went from pagan Rome, papal Rome, was the same thing. Yeah. Same thing. And, uh, and so this was accepted and appreciated, respected by the world. And upon this happening, you had a group of Christians that refused the favor. And their idea was, hey, listen, if the world hated Jesus Christ, how much more shall it think of us? And they objected to the false professions made by those that were coming into the church for political reasons. And they believed it blasphemy to have a man as the head of the church when Jesus Christ is the head of the church seated in heaven. And that led the state church to make a profession. You see the competition's heating up now. You have one group of Christians that won't be a part of that state church. So what did the state church do in time? It said, we are the one true church that Jesus Christ founded. See, why do you say that? Because there's competition. <laughs> there's a group that won't be a part of you. And so they tried to, to castigate them and, and ostracize them. They began to deal with them as they were dealing with cults and what have you there. And, uh, and so uh, what happens there is that the faith of our fathers, brethren, <laughs> they refuse to adapt to a world-approved religion, would not compromise even when it was, would be frowned upon by other Christians. For the first time, you had Christians persecuting Christians in church history, at least those that professed they were. And those who faithfully kept that torch burning during the darkest hours of the church history, friend, listen, that's our heritage. Amen. Amen. You need to realize that's the spirit you're of. I know sometimes it feels like you're out there all alone like Elijah. <laughs> Oh, nobody believes the King James Bible. People don't believe the second coming. They don't believe in soul winning. I mean, there's just all kinds of ways that you're made to feel weird. Amen. But you're of a heritage that said, I don't care. Amen. Right is right. Amen. And wrong is wrong. I want you to look at 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. And we don't know the names of many of those during those dark ages. But the Lord knows who they were. Amen. And one day we'll get to meet them. Amen. We're going to get to meet them there and we're going to get to watch them get rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ for the great role they played in the history of New Testament Christianity. And following the dark ages, there's the faith of our fathers in what is known as the period of the Reformation. And uh, the context here of where I've had you to turn in 2 Kings chapter 22 is of, a, is of a Reformation in Old Testament history. And it happened under the leadership of one of Judah's greatest kings, Josiah, who's doing away, folks, with all the bad religious practices. And he's tearing down idols and he's putting away false prophets and he's restoring the old paths of the true worship of God. And he's doing all this because of one thing. Look at verse 8. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. 
And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. Those were dark times too. But when they found the book of God in the house of God and brought it out there and said, King, look what this book has to say. He read that he realized how far off kilt they were. And brother, the lights came on. <laughs> the lights came on. And the dark ages ended right then, brother. And we got a period in church history where the same thing happened. <laughs> but the people were living in dark. They were kept ignorant by a Bible that was in Latin and they couldn't read it. <laughs> and only those of the higher class in the church that were educated had access to it. And the people had to believe what they were told. They didn't have a copy of the Word of God in their home. They didn't have one that they could put their hand on. And that's the way people were manipulated and controlled. But thank God for those giants of faith that said that the common man ought to have the Word of God. <laughs> and they began to get to work being like Erasmus who worked and studied and and learned and stayed faithful to the proper text. Those uh, of God's scriptures. Amen. And, and then men like John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe's called the morning star of the Reformation. Amen. Whereas he didn't have access to the proper text. He didn't have the right heart and the right spirit about the common man having the word of God. And he produced the first English translation of the scriptures. Amen. And uh, he influenced some people there that were known as lawlers. It was a group of street preachers Amen, that they called Wycliffeites. <laughs> which is strange. And, and they went on to influence the Bohemians. Amen. And they influenced the great Protestant Reformation. Forty-four years after John Wycliffe was dead and gone, you know what they did? They went there and they dug up his remains. <laughs> and they burned them. <laughs> and they cast them into the... You know you've made some people mad. <laughs> when 44 years after you're dead and gone, they come in and officially dig up your bones and burn them and cast them into the river. Amen. John Wycliffe, again, is known as the morning star of the Reformation. And what he was trying to do there... Uh, he was trying to influence people, and he did. He influenced lives like John Huss and William Tyndale, Martin Luther and John Knox and Savonarola. And, and he couldn't do all that he had in his heart to do. But what he did do, he did by the grace of God. Amen. Martin Luther there, when it was a time that was punishable by death there, to speak against the authority of the church, he registered 95 objections he had to the church which he believed to be Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17. And then he went to the church door and he nailed those 95 objections he had to that door in his 95 theses. Amen. Amen. Listen, he defied the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church and he went to work writing and publishing and proclaiming all his objections against that dead religion. Amen. And William Tyndale, who was killed for seeking to get the Word of God in the common man's hands, Amen. Defied the Pope and all his laws. Amen. People thought that he had blasphemed. He said the, he began to talk about the Pope to the priest there, and the, the priest began to challenge him by the Pope. And he said, Listen, if the Lord spare my life, I'll make sure a young man at the plow knows more about the Word of God than you know. And, and then, of course, when the man began to talk about the Pope, he said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And right before they strangled him and burned his body, he prayed, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Amen. And friends, listen, that's your heritage right there. Amen. That authorized King James Bible that you brought to church with you tonight, listen, that's a product of men like William Tyndale and prayers like he prayed right there. Brother, that's a product of what God gave to you through those men, their bodies, their backs, their blood, amen, their freedom. That's how you got your Bible. Amen. That's your history. When people got their hands on the Word of God, the darkness left. <laughs> the lights came on. Amen. Now I want to step back in time here in Old Testament history and go backwards as far as a happening. I want you to go back to 1 Kings chapter 18. And you know what happens in 1 Kings chapter 18. You just kind of look at it. Uh, we don't have to read it, but what happens is the word of, of the fire of God rather falls. And uh, the fire of God falls and the Lord turns the hearts of the people back to Him. And uh, there it's manifest what is true. The fire falls. And there it's manifest what is false. Because the Baalite priests are all bleeding and they're getting dizzy and the flies are buzzing. 
around their altar where no fire has fallen. It is manifest to the people what is true and what is false. And of course that leads us to the next period of church history, the faith of our fathers during the Great Awakening.